linked to or dependent on whether one believes in evolution or one doesn't believe in evolution. The problem with evolutionary idea come when people are trying to claim that through the evolutionary process, uh, without any external influence, all of this came about. All an accident. And when it's all traced back to the beginning point of the Big Bang, what came before, why did the bang take place? See, science is at, loss, at a loss. There is no explanation. They can only talk about what happened after. But what happened before? Why did it begin? No answers. So the issue of uh, uh, belief in the first human being uh, being referred to or the name given by God to them as Adam and Eve, uh, this is part of our belief. It is part of revelation. And science will never be able to go back to that point and say who were the first two anyway. Okay, um, first let me say that there is a um, site or a program on YouTube which says Harun Yahya is uh, an idol worshipper. Yeah. yeah, okay. This site I did not put up. <laughs> People have taken a section of a lecture which I gave then put their own title on it and put it on the YouTube. So I would not stand up and say Harun Yahya is an idol worshipper. Okay, so please just, you know, any of you who... Actually, I, it, I guess I should try to do some sort of rebuttal to that and to clarify for people on it. But if you actually listen to what is said there, I don't say there in any of the statements that Harun Yahya is an idol worshipper. It's not there. It's not there in, in the actual uh, video recording. What I was explaining, and this is a point with peop that people have to be aware of, that Harun Yahya promoted in a number of his books. In the back, in the end of the book, there's an appendix. And maybe later uh, copies, they dropped it, you know, after there were enough complaints and things arose about it, where he started to speak about matter, the truth about matter. And basically, his arguments were the arguments of a, a philosopher uh, among Muslims in the past by the name of Ibn Arabi, who promoted or projected the idea known as Wahdatul Wujud, which means there is only one existence. Only Allah exists. Everything else is an illusion. So it means ultimately that the realities of everything is Allah. That only Allah exists. You, what is real about you is Allah. What is real about me is Allah. And so you had this individual stating that there is no need to worship any uh, God beyond yourself. You can worship yourself. So this goes against all of the teachings of the prophets. Every, all the prophets taught us to worship God, not to worship ourselves or to worship other human beings. So this philosophy is a false philosophy which was rejected by the mass of the Muslim scholarship. You see, so they reject that. So that's what I told people to be aware of. Because as a part of it, he even claimed, you know, that uh, heaven and earth are one and the same. And that, you know, there's a variety of other statements that he made which are not in keeping with Islamic teachings, but it is in keeping with this kind of approach that there is only one existence. What they call monism. It's really monism. It's a, it's a, and it is, ends up being a form of pantheism or a justification for pantheism. Because if you say that Allah is in everything, Allah is the essence of everything, then the idol worshipper, for example, the average Hindu if, who is, has some knowledge, if you ask him why is he worshipping such and such an idol, he will explain that I'm not actually worshipping the idol that you're seeing here. What I'm worshipping is God, 
the same God that you're worshipping, who becomes focused in the idol at the time of my worship. So it becomes that approach, that understanding becomes a justification for worshipping other than God in the end. Because even though he says that, if his idol falls and breaks, he can't worship it anymore. He has to go and buy a new one. So it's telling you that though he's saying, yes, I'm worshipping God, focusing the idol, he's really worshipping the idol. So I have a question that, why is it permissible for a Muslim man to marry a Christian or a Jewish girl, but the wife was said not permissible. A Muslim woman cannot marry a man or a boy who is a Christian or a Jew. The reply is given in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 5, it says, lawful for you in marriage are the women of the Ahli Kitab. So Quran clearly says that for a Muslim man, he can marry a woman from the Ahli Kitab, but the wife versa is not true. The logical reason is that whenever a Muslimah, a Muslim girl, if she has to marry a man who is a Christian, she is going to their family. And if a Muslim boy is marrying a Christian girl, she is coming to the family of the Muslim family. Now here what happens, that for the Christian girl or a Jewish girl, what we say, that we believe in all the prophets that you believe. For the Christian we say, you have to believe in an additional prophet that is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we can prove from the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, prophesies about the last and final prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For the Jewish, we have to say, you have to believe in an additional two prophets. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we can prove from the Bible about both, our Old Testament. So we aren't abusing any of the prophets. We respect all the prophets, we say, you believe in additional two for the Jewish. And for the Christian, additional one. That's it. It's easy. There's no conflict. So when she comes to a Muslim home, it's easy for her to live. We don't abuse any of the prophets. We, are, we ask her to believe in additional one or additional two. But the vice versa, when a Muslim goes to a Christian family or a Jewish family, there, these people, they don't believe in Muhammad And if they go to a Jewish family, they don't believe in Isa and Muhammad Wasallam. So it will be difficult for them to live. So this is the basic purpose. But besides this, as far as marrying a Christian lady, I have my personal difference of opinion. Though most of the scholars, they agree that you can marry any Christian woman. But I believe in the minority scholars who say that you cannot marry any Christian lady, whether she be Mary or she be Sheila, whatever it is, or Jane. Because the verse of the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 221 says, do not marry a mushrika until she believes. Do not marry a mushrika, do not marry an idol worshipper until she believes. A momina, a believing woman, is far superior than an idolatress, even if she allows you. She may be the queen of England, she may be the most beautiful woman in the world, but a slave woman, a born woman, she may be the ugliest, but if she is a Muslim, she is far superior to an idolatress. That's what the Quran says. And the same thing is on the opposite for a believing woman, they should not marry a, a mushrik man until he believes. Now, here the Quran says you can marry a Christian woman. The other verse of Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter 221 says you cannot marry a mushrika. And we know that the Christians, when they worship Jesus Christ, peace be they are doing shirk. It mentioned Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 72. It says, Lakat kafr lazina kalu, in the laha, who are Masih ibn Marema. They are in kufr. Those who say Allah is Isa salam, the son of Mary. Waqal al Masih, but said Christ. Ya many Israel. O children of Israel. Ubudullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. In no way, Shaykh Billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah. Fakat haram ala al Jannah. Allah will make Jannah haram for him. Mama wa hunnar. And fire shall be dwelling place and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. So based on this verse, one verse says you can marry any Christian woman. It says Christian woman, not any. The thing I'll tell you later on. One verse says you can't marry Mushrika. Sorry, Maida chapter 5 verse 72 says that Christians are doing kuf and shirk. 
So isn't there a contradiction? The reply is given in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 110 which says that Min humul mu'minuna wa khsawmul fasikun Among the early kitab, there are some who are mu'min but the majority are poverty transgressors. So according to my research, I believe in those minority scholars who say you can marry